Yes, brilliant. Thanks, Miguel. <laughs> um, hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to another CDI seminar. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with CDI, it's a collaboration between um, us here at IDS, uh, our friends down the road, ITAD, who work in evaluation, and the University of East Anglia. Um, and so our collaboration is around methodological innovation and impact evaluation. And so part of what we do is run seminars. We also have practice papers and we run short courses as well. And today, I'm super happy to be able to welcome Jess Dart, um, who's on a world tour. <laughs> it's her second or third stop. Um, yeah, third, yeah. Third stop. So uh, Jess is based in Australia. She is um, the founder of Clear Horizon, uh, which some of you may be familiar with has been working for many years in participatory evaluation, was part of establishing MSC as a method that we all use and love, but has also been innovating um, with evaluation methodology for many years. Um, so Jess today is going to be speaking to us about some newer work, which is around how we evaluate place-based systems change work or something along those lines. Um, and yeah, so super excited. We've got uh, an hour. So what we'll do is um, Jess is going to speak for about half an hour, 40 minutes. Oh no, don't minute, cancel. Excuse me while Zoom, yep. Um, oh dear, <laughs> apologies. We're just having some Zoom trouble here. Um, so for those of you online, Please put your thoughts, questions, comments in the chat please, as we please, go through. Yours, apparently, because we've been signed out. Okay. But how? But they can still see us. No, I think this is a legacy. Oh dear. <laughs> the world of hybrid. I think they can still see. You think they can still see us? That's bizarre. Sorry, everyone online. Can you still see us? Yes, we can see you and hear you. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, thanks, Joe. Sorry. It's telling us we were signed out. So uh, I'll hand over to Jess now. Um, so those of you online, please put your thoughts in, in the chat. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and some discussion. So Jess, over to you. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody. It's really nice to be here. <clears throat> I thought I should tell you where I'm from because you might might struggle to know what's going on with my accent. So I'm originally from the UK. I'm from Yorkshire, but I um, then worked in international development for a while and then settled in Australia. And I have lived there for 25 years. So my accent is some strange blend of a Yorkshire and Australian. So that's where I'm from. And also it's probably relevant to talk about where I work today. While Clear Horizon does work in international development, about a third of our work is in international development in the Asia Pacific. The rest of it is actually in Australia. So we do a lot of work in with Australian communities, with First Nations communities and um, around Australia. So the work that I'm talking to you today about actually doesn't come from international development. It comes from the work we've been doing in Australia. But I know there's a lot of interest in it in international development and maybe possibly uh, there's, there's, there's more grounding in it currently in a domestic setting, which is unusual. Sometimes, Often international development is ahead uh, and we learn so much from that, but sometimes it's the other way around. So that's what I'm hoping that it will give you some insights because I've just been to the American Evaluation Conference and Marina was there too. And there was a lot of talk about how to do systems change work. So I don't think it's going, I think it's going to grow and I think you'll hear more about it is my hunch. And one of the reasons why I think you'll hear more about it is there are signs, there are promising signs that it works, which is uh, important when the world is where it is at today, when there's so many challenges to deal with and they're collective challenges. They are not things we can solve by a single agency or, a, a, you know, one group on their own. They're going to require lots of people working together. And that's pretty much what this is about. Yeah. So let me tell you what I'm talking about. I thought I'd better start, before I talk about how you evaluate it, I, I thought I'd better start explaining what the thing is that I'm talking about. What do I mean by place-based approaches? What are systems change approaches? And then I'll move on to the evaluation of it. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to cover, as I said, how we understand systems change and place-based approaches largely in Australia. Some challenges and insights about what that means for evaluation. And then there are, um, there are quite a lot of tools and things that we've developed to do this work. But in particular, there's a generic theory of change, which I'll share with you, um, which is like a, a sort of guidance for how to do theory of change on this. And there's also um, a few tools that I will share with you, including a sort of set of evaluation questions. So what do I mean by systems change and place-based approaches? Well, let's start with systems change. I don't know if you've seen this um, framework, the Kennefin model is really useful to explain about uh, working in complex contexts, which is what we often are doing these days. Um, so how many of you know this framework, just so I know, yeah, but not everybody. It's, co it's good if you haven't done it, it's quite useful to know. So um, the, the, this like, it goes around like that and each, and Kennefin is a Welsh word and it means habitat. So it sort of means context, different types of context. You can think of it as a planning context, if you like. So a simple, uh, when, you, when your problems are not too, too difficult, so like how to turn the light on, um, it might be fairly obvious and we can work it out. It's always the same, easy stuff, no problem. The next level up, a complicated problem, how to build an aeroplane, right? You've got to be, I can't build an aeroplane. Can anybody in here build an aeroplane? Definitely needs expertise. So it needs lots of expertise, but it is knowable. With the right expertise, you can you can guarantee that the plane won't fall out of the sky. So we know how to do that. A lot of our evaluation methodologies were designed for this sort of stuff. Um, and then we sort of move into the next level is complex, where you can't actually know what the right thing is to do. This is very challenging for people. It's almost like um, it's uncharted work. We don't know the answers. We have to sort of like feel our way through try things that we think might work, that might not work. And it's sort of the, the work that I'm going to talk to you about shortly fits, a lot of it fits in this space. And then you've got chaotic. And when you get to chaotic, like in the middle of a war or a crisis or a children's party, um, you, there is no point even evaluating. You, you, there is no, no, you can't really plan, you just got to act. So the, the space, I guess, um, a lot of the work that I'm going to talk to you about today is responding to that sort of context. The world of log, who knows what a log frame is? Yeah, they, that grew up in that space, not in this space. Nothing wrong with log frames, but you can't make a log framework for the sort of thing I'm going to tell you about. So systems change, let's get to the next bit. So I'll try and give you a definition. This is um, my definition, I think, but I think I've borrowed it from a lot of others, as you do. So systems change intervention, so that's the work we do to intervene, aim to shift the things that are holding complex social or environmental problems in place. I guess that's it. So it's trying to work out what is causing the change. And that just sounds like a lot of what we do. Um, I guess these are at larger scale and they're designed to fundamentally change the components and structures that cause systems to behave in a certain way. And I guess one of the things that I try to stress is this is we're not talking about programs. I'll give you an example of one, uh, but it's working across and above program. <laughs> like you, you normally like you have a program, you've got your outcomes, you're trying to do it. We're not talking about that. We're talking about working with a whole series of existing programs and systems and trying to see how it all fits together and doing actions to make it work. That makes sense. It operates at large scale. And I'll explain it more. And we often use this, uh, this uh, framework called the iceberg model, and there's a few different versions of it, but I'll try and give you a really simple example. I guess what we see in it, what we see is only right at the top, just like an iceberg is hidden under the water. But when we see something happen, we see the events, such as, let's say um, there's, a, there's an incident. Um, one, one guy takes a knife and there's a knifing attack. Um, I'll take Sydney because I'm talking about my context. There's a knifing attack in a suburb in Sydney. Now you might look at that and go, okay, one guy's been bad. Let's do something about that. You might lock him up. You might make sure the victim's okay, but you are only working on the symptoms, yeah? So by coming down, you might look at the patterns. Oh, this has been increasing. Gangs have been increasing. Why is that? Poverty has been going up. There's low employment in these spaces. There's a concentration of employment. And you start to look at all the things and the patterns that might be occurring. Then you go down the next level. So like 
what what what's holding those things in place what's holding unemployment in place there how did that lead to be and when you finally get to the very bottom of the iceberg we end up with mental models uh, mental models about equality power uh, what's right what's wrong race it gets very deep but that's the most transformational space to operate at and this stuff tries to go all the way down so i guess that's an example so um but what, what they say in systems thinking is what happened at the top is an inevitable consequence of the system. So that knifing attack was always going to happen because it's an inevitable consequence of how things are set up in the system, the inequality, the structures, the norms, what society has favoured. So if you want to fix that, you have to go pretty deep down to make a permanent change, a sustainable change. This is where this stuff comes from. Um, and we, use, we like to use this particular framework quite a lot, the waters of six systems change. I think it's a great resource. Mm -hmm. It's got a sort of more sort of pointy appro approach to that, but it's still sort of iceberg. You've got the mental models at the bottom. But they show us that what we can see is policies, practices, and resource flows. Resource flows being money and, uh, you know, um, sort of capability people. The middle level, power dynamics, relationships, and connections. And these are conditions that are required to shift a system. And that's what we work with. All sounds a bit mystical, maybe. <laughs> um, when we get to place, it gets a little bit more tangible. So place-based approaches. Take all of that within a geographical boundary. It's quite simple. So it's normally a suburb or a location or a small community. Generally not that big. Like they normally work on like 2,000 to 4,000 people, not huge cities if it was a huge city you'd take a part of it because yeah you sort of have to it's so complex it really helps to have a geographic boundary and you get people to agree on what it is that they want to work on and then there's an incredible amount of people work together on it and they use learning because it's complex they don't know what will work they try things they they assess what's working and they engage very broadly and the good ones have community at the center on the leadership table, so it's community-centered. One, you might have heard of it as one approach to this stuff is collective impact, and that came out of America, but this is not all using collective impact. I just thought I'd give you an example. This is from Australia. So there's a suburb called Logan, which is south of Brisbane, and it's warm and sunny, <laughs> and uh, about a third of all the people living in poverty in Queensland live in that suburb. So it has a lot of challenges and the government spends millions of dollars there on the justice system, child protection system, uh, got a, a, a lot of things going on there, inevitable consequence of what's come before. Um, so, and there were riots and the people there rose up and said, this is enough, it's not safe to live here anymore and our children are not doing well. And that started it off in 2015. And so it's been going for a while and they got together and agreed that the most important thing was to see children by the, the age of eight to thrive. But that then involved 150 different agencies to work together with community at the table and First Nations groups. So um, I've got 100 there, 100, 150, somewhere between there. Um, but three levels of government. In Australia, we have, to have three levels of government, local government, state government, federal government. Everybody was part of it to try and address this because if you can fix it, because they were spending so much money and things were getting worse. So it really required, community were fed up and government were fed up, everybody was fed up. So it, that's why it sort of sprinkled this off. So that's a good, and they have actually um, done amazing work since then. And they have um, some contribution analysis case studies that show that certain things have got better um, in, some, in some areas. Yeah, so yeah, that's where the example is any questions about that? So systems change approaches are not necessarily in a place, but they operate in a similar sort of way and they are on the rise, particularly trying to deal with complex issues, things that sometimes people call them wicked problems. So where, where programmatic approaches have not been successful, this is the next step up. Uh, but it requires people, everybody, to learn to work together differently. Like organisations have to put their agendas at the door and agree to work together, even on things like attribution. Was it me? Who cares whether it was you or not? What we want to know is, did we collectively make a difference? So it sort of shifts a whole lot of things. 
But how do you evaluate them? They have. <laughs> I'm an evaluator and they have challenges. Yeah. The question is actually come back to it. But likely, when you analyze the problem, there are quite a lot of issues which, which you can't resolve in, in that geographical play. Uh, yes, exactly. Place. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go further apart. You. Often what happens is the place-based approaches get together and it's often networked and they raise similar challenges. Like you, we often talk about a policy ceiling. There may be a federal government policy that is preventing something that discover is the problem. And then what they'll often do is join together with, other, there are a hundred place-based, there are a hundred of these, over a hundred of these in Australia. They're quite big, quite popular. And so they are often networked. So it's not just one community together, they're networked with the other. And together they advocate to get change, often policy change at a federal government level. And that's been quite successful getting that done. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to note that there is two types of things that get called systems evaluation. What I'm talking about is how you evaluate systems change innovation or systems change interventions. There's another thing called systems evaluation, and that is how you evaluate a system, but I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about how you evaluate people's efforts to change the system. There's a bit of overlap between them, but you can get very confused if you get mixed up with those two. So um, we tend to talk about MEL as well, rather than evaluation, but evaluation covers all of it because there's a lot of measurement. Uh, there's a whole load of learning uh, as well as what you would normally consider as evaluation study. So we tend to use the word MEL, but and I'm, I'm going to keep talking about evaluation and mean all of that. Um, okay, so what are the challenges to this? So um, the first thing, really, an obvious thing to say is that it's challenging because they are not programs. Evaluation grew up in the world of programs. We talk about program evaluation. So most of the literature books, they are written about program evaluation. They're not written about evaluating things that go across programs that have large time frames and multiple actors that are so, so the typical evaluation tools and don't work very well. So it does require a different sort of approach. And even, and not even that, is people want to go sort of like they want to get, they sort of want to go back to the tram tracks that they used to. And so we, we, sometimes it takes us a while to get people to really agree to move away from traditional approaches. So that's a challenge in its own right. But one of the biggest problems is, I haven't really mentioned this, this stuff takes a long time. This stuff typically, the time frames that people talk about, the, the smallest time frame is about nine years because it takes about two or three years to set up even the basics of the collaboration that you don't see any change in the first. You may not see much change in terms of population improvements or environmental improvements for the first five years. Programs are typically funded to a maximum of five years and we get something called expectations failure. That's what we call it, which is funders get nervous because they can't see results. And so we, we have had to work on that quite a lot to see that there are actually results. It's just not what you think typically a result would be in the early stages. So that's one thing we've needed to work with. Uh, the other thing is that it's emergent and dynamic practice. You probe and try things and it's uncharted work we don't know what the answers are so this idea of setting goals and then have you achieved your goals sort of doesn't work very well at all but a number of times i've uh, worked in the space where boards or funders have said well did they achieve their goals and i've said no they haven't achieved their goals but they did something better or something different um and funders don't like that very much so that's the first thing we try and avoid a goal uh, annual goals are really not very helpful. Five-year goals are really not very helpful because you tend not to achieve them, but you can do really good work. You can do other things because if you don't know what you need to do, you're not going to know what the goals should be either. So that really, most of our evaluation work involves assessing whether goals are being predetermined outcomes to be met. You can't really do that. It's the first really big challenge. And then there are many moving pieces. There's different scales different time, different actors. It doesn't all happen at once. Change doesn't occur all in one big blob. It tends to happen in sort of little pockets and you, that you have to be able to capture that change. Um, and then there's the issue of whose reality counts. 
Increasingly, this work is done in First Nations contexts in Australia, where, um, you know, and First Nations communities are rightly saying that they don't want to be described in other people's terms, especially using deficit indicators and descriptions of their community, and they want to have a say in how uh, the communities are described and want to have a say in whether it's successful or not. So there's this idea of, well, how do you judge whether it's good or not and who gets to do that? Um, and that's really important in this stuff. And then you, the other thing is you have these, these organisations called intermediaries. Have you heard that term before? So an intermediary or a boundary partner is an organisation, a boundary organisation that, um, in fact, I think intermediaries are largely produced because funders don't really want to fund directly into the communities because it's a bit chaotic. So they fund another party that sits in between the place-based approaches. So it's like a, uh, in the collective impact, they call the sort of secretariat, the neutral secretariat that works on this, the backbone organization. So it's like one above the backbone of backbones. So that's the ones that receive the funding, they've helped build capacity and support all the other um, convene networks. So that's the part that's often funded and it's really hard to evaluate their contribution and to separate that out from the work of the collective. So it's another sort of piece that gets challenging. So anyway, we developed this uh, place-based evaluation framework for Logan Together. Uh, we, was, um, we were commissioned by the Australian government and the Queensland government, because nobody knew how to evaluate these things, and about a framework for how to evaluate them, which is online and it's free. So if you wanna look it up, I'll give you the links um, and it's got a toolkit and everything and we tested it in Logan together as proof of concept and um, about 150 people were involved in building it so even though I'm the author I am by no means the only person who contributed to it so that's a resource for you but I'm just going to show you a few bits from that really um, so that's the link to the framework so the framework consists of a set of principles some planning steps a concept cue uh, a theory of change to help think about how theories of change might work, a, a sample set of key evaluation questions and a toolkit. Yeah. How am I going for time? Yeah. The principles that we apply are that, um, it's actually a concept called strategic learning, is that you need to learn all the way through and you need to learn at different levels. Strategic learning is a concept that's been um, talked about a lot at the moment. And it, um, they talk about three levels of learning. You know, like double loop learning, you've probably all heard of double loop learning. They call this triple loop learning. So one is learning about what works and what doesn't. Two is sort of working about learning about your own strategy and how you're thinking about change. But the third one, actually really important, is learning about your own role in the system. So it's inner, a bit like the inner development goals, if you've heard of them. It's about thinking about how, what's your role as an individual in how you are showing up. And this is something that we evaluate. We evaluate how governments show up in these places. We evaluate how evaluators show up. So we've been doing this thing about how evaluators are part of the problem, for example, and we're all trying to take responsibility for what's holding the system in place. So it includes learning about your own role. Um, outcomes focused, inclusive all the way through. Yeah, I'll come to this, but you cannot just design an evaluation plan for this stuff and roll it out. You cannot do what's called waterfall planning. We use agile planning, smaller plans for shorter periods because things change so much. First time I did this stuff, I built a big plan for this initiative. It was about five years ago. And I built, took my time, built this plan with a theory of change and indicators. And I just got it finished when the initiative pivoted. And they decided to not do all of this stuff and do all this stuff. And I thought, oh, I'll have to redo the plan. So I redid the entire plan. And guess what happened? They pivoted again. So I redid the plan again. I used my entire budget in evaluation planning before I'd ever written an evaluation report or collected any data. So I've never done that again since. So I'm just sharing with my, my, my failures here. Um, so it's really important that you don't develop big plans. You have to manage expectations for results and the sort of methods you need to use need to be systems aware. Your definition of melody is, is measuring people based on their analysis, different mm. than monitoring. 
Yeah, we've switched from monitoring to measurement. Uh, so what is, if, if, if the things are so dynamic and changing, how do we, how do we define what to monitor or to measure? From, yeah, at least for getting the information to the platform. I'll come to it. I'll show you what we do, but we do measure different things. But the term measurement in Australia, there's a really big movement called social impact measurement. And it's about, um, and the word measurement is, is favoured. So that's why we use it, but it doesn't really mean any difference. I just thought I'd point that out. But um, we do use public data, you see. So we're looking at context. We're looking at demographic data, public data from the census, from a whole lot of different data sources. And there's this huge thing about data sharing going on. So the government has to share its data with communities. So you can look at what's happening to different things in your community. So when we say measurement and when we say data, we're looking at different types of data. I'll come to it, I'll come to what I mean. But here's the concept cube, which sort of lays out the main conceptual framework for how we think about it. So first thing to know, it's in a context. So every community is different, has history. That means that different things will work. Um, so, and different challenges. So it's really important to note that this is generic, but it's always in a context. So um, up this green level, we have like a really, really simple theory of change, I guess, four levels, is that you've got to get the starting conditions together, build the enablers for change, then you'll see some systemic change in the community. And it's only after that that you get population impact. And straight away, we're making it clear that that isn't going to start happening straight away. And so this is, uh, brings the notion of time into it. And at the side are the things that we look at. So we are interested in, in results or change, of course, uh, outcomes, what's happened, but we're also learning. It's a very strong, it's, the learning is almost as important as anything. And, uh, and process, whether it was, um, you know, in when you're working in the First Nations context, it has to be what we call culturally safe. So it's really important that we think about how we do the work. And generally speaking, we have a set of principles that hold us all steady and we evaluate against the principles as well because nothing stays still. The outcomes don't stay the same. Theory of change doesn't stay the same. But one thing that anchors us is a set of principles that we agree to and everybody gets evaluated against the principles, including the funders and the evaluators. How do they take that? Well, they, yeah, they've been... In Australia, it's fascinating. Some of governments, particularly state government, have been really, really investing in this. And they have, for example, where I live in Victoria, there's a, there's a, re a place-based reform team across all departments. And, they, um, and they, they, they talk about how they have to show up differently. And so, yes, we got a job to evaluate. They invited us to evaluate them. How about that? So some better than others. But there's a rubric, yeah, there's an actual assessment about how government is showing up because, yeah. Anyway, so the theory of change, which I'm going to show you in a sec, it's a generic one, it's got five levels, but you, then it looks a bit different than a normal theory of change because we've got it takes ages to get things going. So you've got the foundation, got the enablers, got the systemic, and then we have this thing called instances of impact because we have that there, it's not really a level, it's sort of cheating, but it's so helpful to put it there anyway. Because before you get population level change, you get little popcorn, pop, pop, pop of change. And it's really important to gather that because it builds momentum and hope. So we have that in there because it happens first. So these are the sort of generic theory of change that we share with people. But, you know, the foundations, it even takes a while. And they say that, you know, you have to be sufficiently ready to do this sort of work. We've got the history and the community. The community have to want to do it. It's got to be voluntary. Um, and you need to have enough resourcing, you need to have adequately resourced sort of infrastructure to do it. And they're the things, the enablers for change that when we designed this framework, people felt were most important. Things like multi-sectoral collaboration, high, come back to that, capacity building, so everybody has to learn about it, transparent and inclusive governance, so you have a governance over the top of it, authentic engagement, strategic learning, and what they call high leverage activities, it's jargon, but it means... Um, because you're not funding it new services or new programs, okay? So it's not a program. But what you're looking at is what are all the services and all of the programs. And you, you're trying to move the building blocks so that more efficient spending, essentially, 
and you working on the interstitial spaces between things. And so the high leverage activities are to lever, lever, lever the existing spending and programs. That's how it works. And then um, if it's going well, you're supposed to get changes in some of these system things, conditions such as policies, practices, resource flows. That's what gets spent, money, where it goes, <coughs> relationships and connections, power dynamics, mm -hmm. and the mental models. And that's the sort of um, framing of it. Of course, you wouldn't, this is a generic in the sense that you're supposed to redo your own. It's just to sort of give people a sense because people didn't know about these hidden levels and they'd never worked with them before. So it was hard if you don't have that in there. And people build their own. These are the theory of change from Logan. It didn't look like that. It was, and built it as a tree. Yeah. And we also, this is actually really important, this slide is to manage expectations. We take that thinking and we throw it across time and we got agreement with this. We got agreement with federal government about these timeframes. This is where the expectations management comes in because we agreed then because you, then you can have it generally we'll have phased evaluation plans we'll have one for each sort of block so in year zero which could go on for two or three years there's nothing you can evaluate other than lessons from trying to start much really and then in the initial years when it gets started we, we look at how people are showing up um, uh, how the leaders are showing up and whether you're beginning to uh, build these conditions for change and who you've got at the table and whether the capacity is being built. And that's all you evaluate. And then when you get into the middle years, two to five, you can start to evaluate some of these systemic shifts. And you only bother really looking at the population change in the final stages. You know, we're going to change the overall strength and emphasize the sort of an outcome, uh, intermediate outcome level which is far beyond, below your, in your levels, because you, you have already systemic changes fighting. Or if you could go to the other slide. So and strategic learning of technical engagement leads to system change, systemic change already. Well, what, what I um, often see is that there is a intermediate level, which is the most interesting to monitor, which is changes in the ones that are participating in the partnerships, changes in their institutions, and then changes in the system. Yeah, these are sort of uh, intermediate levels. These are all happen at the same time. I mean, like, uh, practices is changes in institutions. So they don't all happen at once. This is just, it's just that you don't tend to get any of that for three or four years. So we're focusing on this level. Yeah, I mean, people step out in a lot more detail what their theories of change look like. But when they started doing this work, they only had at that level. They had like, we want to see, you know, we're going to measure. They had, they were measuring like, you know, child developmental stuff. They wouldn't have anything down here at all. So we, we, um, that's why we, we're naming it. That's the start of this stuff is to name it. Yeah. 30 minutes is up. Cool. Um, what I wanted to share to you is we sort of offered a set of evaluation questions. So the cube translates into a, what might you ask in the first two years and what criteria is it about? So that's what the color coding is. And it's just like a set of questions to think about where you might focus your effort at different times. So that's quite useful. People use this a lot, but don't use it exactly. It's more of getting a, an idea of what you would look at. The, the main thing is it's phased, I think. The main lesson from all of this is don't try and evaluate everything at once. You waste your time. Work out, you know, focus your effort in what's in front of you. Um, and that's more useful. Uh, we focus on always contribution rather than attribution. We've pretty much given up on attribution analysis in this sort of work. Um, although there is some new work going on at the moment using synthetic control groups so if, do I need to explain the difference between attribution and contribution so contribution is um, is proving that a leads to b that we know it was we did it we sort of give up a bit on that in contribution analysis and accept that multiple things cause change and in this case multiple actors we can't tease apart the role of all the different players what you might want to do is check whether the overarching initiative itself with all of the actors made a difference 
it's a bit hard to disentangle the work of the initiative from the existing program so so because you're leveraging their spending to see how it works so it's tricky but you can like look to see where where there's a place-based approach versus where there isn't um is you know what's happening in those places a bit but it's um and that's where the synthetic controls are coming in which are developed using precision analytics and sort of historical data do you use that sort of stuff here yeah. yeah. sort of merging space lots of it's big data yeah um we use the uh, little test called the what else test i might just stop though i feel like um the toolkit's there there's a there's about 50 tools on there, probably similar to the sort of tools you've been writing about, Marina, to evaluate at different levels. But one of the key tools that actually, I might just show you, is that we do a lot of logging. It sounds pretty basic, but um, because you've got a whole bunch of people involved, like you might have hundreds of people involved in this work, um, you um, can harness what we call the eyes and the ears. And we have a little iPhone, um, we have smartphone apps, we have uh, what's called an impact lock. So if you see anything, that you think is shifting, like you see people talking differently about what it's like to live in this town, or you see people uh, like a change in how um, uh, services are working together, you log it and you say, should we follow this up? Yes or no, you just provide a bit of information and that goes into a database and it's followed up. And if there's something significant, we follow it up with a most significant change story. And then if, if, that, if we get a number of change stories, we do a contribution analysis. So we sort of flow up that way, but it's sort of got a flow of logs. Logs are good. And the other thing, I'm just going to show you one more specific um, measure approach is rubrics. So rubrics in particular, progress mapping rubric that we use. Um, change is considered against five levels. And then uh, generally speaking, all of those enablers will have a rubric and will describe what it looks like if it's just right at the beginning in the community and what it looks like if it's transformational. And it's sort of work, little dot points that describe what you'd see if it was at one place and the community themselves um, map out where they think it is. And then we use the same rubric across a lot of different collective impacts to get a common language. But there is one rubric about how government is showing up. <laughs> so that gives you a sense. I better stop there, that's probably enough. Of course, there's quite a lot to this. Um, I should say that um, if you're interested in what I'm talking about, this is a course, uh, but it is a paid course. There's also the um, this course. I've got. I've actually got some brochures if anybody's interested. Um, it comes out of Australia, but it's online, so it is accessible. Um, I think there's, what's this that my team have put in? There's a discount <laughs> if you use that. If you take a picture of that or get the thing, you can get a discount. But... Um, what I'm going to say is um, the toolkit and the guide is online and that is free. Uh, obviously, this is a paid course, but if you're interested in it, I think it is about a 10 week course. It's about three hours uh, a week. One hour virtual, the rest is self paced learning. And you have a go at working with the Logan Together example. Yeah. Brilliant. Um Thanks so much, Jess. So we've got good time for, for questions and discussion. Um, for those online, please get your thoughts in the chat and I can come to you. I don't see any for the moment. Um, maybe just to kick us off. Um, I love that there's lots of bricolage, as you know, it's one of the things that I'm interested in. Um, but one of the things that I think we often experience with um, these complexity aware approaches. So you mm. started with complexity in the Kinevan framework, which I think is um, increasingly a way people are, are sort of setting the scene for a conversation about more complexity aware evaluation. When we get then into the theory of change conversations, we end up breaking it down in a linear way, right? And there's always this discomfort. I mean, I don't have a solution to this. I have this discomfort with how do you, how do you really embrace the, the complexity of the process mm. of change? And it goes a bit, I think, feel to your point, which is, yes, those things that are in, on your generic theory of change are not all identified in a clear linear way, because as you said, they're happening in different, um, that, you know, it, it's not linear, right? So, mm. so things can be, uh, and there are feedback loops, etc. So I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about 
as you implement this over a five-year period, how do you navigate it? How do you yeah. deal with the fact that some of it is written out in a fairly linear way and your contribution analysis is looking for those lines, right? Mm. But on the other hand, the reality is that things are emerging. How do you, how do you navigate that? Yeah, in this sort of work, especially in the first, the theory of change is normally built straight away. That's the first thing. We don't build it straight away. What we I do these days after learning the hard way is I co-develop a set of principles and we evaluate against those. And they are the most durable bits. And mm -hmm. in a way, they and we use Michael Patton's approach to uh, principles focused evaluation so that a principle is very specific. It means it's a way we behave that leads to the outcomes we want to see. But it starts with our behaviour and we commit to them. So, for example, in our town, which is an initiative I'm working on at the moment, there are four principles, so you'll get the hang of it. The first one is community-led, so everything comes back to that. The second one is modelling mentally healthy behaviour. That means everybody has to model mentally healthy behaviour. Seeing and acting on the bigger picture and learn our way through change. And we evaluate ourselves every six months against those four principles and everybody gets evaluated against them. And we talk about when they're slipping and when they're tracking. And so we don't use the theory of change in that we've given up on using theory of change at that messy stage, mm -hmm. but the principles are durable. So I guess, I know it sounds crazy, but don't rely too much on the theory of change to do everything for you. And so we found that other things work better and we try and keep our theories of change fairly simple. Uh, but we cling to our principles for life and they don't change. Everything else changes, but the principles, if principles change, something really major is happening. Um, in terms of the theory of change, I guess the main thing to know is that once you build one and you think you've got a sense of what you're doing, they um, they change a lot. You they, they are adapted as you learn. We build them on large, sticky walls, repositional spray, and when they get getting moved around. And really... <clears throat> I think the key thing is that big level of those with the levels, it's pretty high level and it's more there to remind us that we're not expecting to see change all at once. It's largely about managing expectations and timeframes and explaining to the funders that they're not going to see population level change straight away. And might, might not sound a lot, but that is the ruining of so many of these things. So keep it fairly simple. It's when we decide on an initiative that we go nuts, we have nested theories of change. So when we decide on a high leverage activity, we go nuts. We have causal loops and we go really deep into theory of change land, but we do it on a piece. We do it. So we do it in a, pack, a nested, we call them nested theories of change, where we have an innovation to do something, to shift something. So we have it at two levels. So that's how we do it. Keep it because otherwise we just go mad, really. And actually each level has its own theory of change. So normally the high level population level change has a technical theory of change about you know, how do you how do you improve team, you know, reduce team pregnancy? And it sort of gets quite technical about behaviors that people, it's like a medical model almost. Mm -hmm. So that's the high level one. And the low level one is more about the systems change. So, and we go into, they get, generally there's normally a few different versions. This is what I've learned. Don't try and think one theory of change model is gonna be enough, you know. Yes. No, I mean, that definitely resonates with the, the way in which we think mm -hmm. about very based approaches and nesting. Mm, nesting yeah. And yeah. we don't we don't we never do contribution analysis on a big thing. We do it on a like for example in Logan Together, I'll give you an example. In Logan Together, people noticed and it bubbled up that they had done some work on maternity hubs because there was um they want there was some issues with women not going to the hospital because they didn't feel safe and and there were there were problems with pregnancies and that led to child development problems when it was followed through. So they did all this work on making, changing the way the maternity hubs, they brought the maternity hubs into, into the community and made them really different. And the rate of, one of the things that happened is the rate of cesarean sector went, uh, section went right down to a lot more natural good births, like 20% large change. And so the question was, was that because of the initiative? Mm -hmm. So then we did a contribution analysis on that. And that is actually published if you want to see the contribution analysis. Yeah. Interesting. So spotting the outcomes and then diving after in after that, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm loving this. It's great. Thank you. Um, really interested. Only sort of got to the run out of time with the tools, but like the process of collecting the data. Like how do you how do you do that? And 
Get the scale of the stars, you know, what, what, how do you actually get do the measurement needs or, or yeah, yeah, so and then and then how you use that data, so how then that feeds into your feedback loops and your sort of yeah. Feedback. So there's normally a team, a backbone team, I called, or a, or a the implementing team, or the that are doing the work who are collecting the data themselves. So it's not done by external people, it's done by people themselves. And they, the logs is one thing that everybody collects. And when they tick it, they then will do a follow-up with the most significant change. So they're collecting stories. And when they think there's a bubble up, they normally get their evaluation partner to do the contribution analysis, because that's quite technical. So the, one of the things that you might not have realized is a lot of the evaluation work is being done by non-evaluators here. So community themselves in our town, the other initiative in South Australia that I'm working on, it's the mums and dads, hairdressers and mechanics, local people, they're not service providers. This is the thing that I, people don't always understand in this work. They're the ones doing the theory of change and collecting the data and they get coached to do it. So the, mostly they collect fairly basic data. They collect logs, they collect stories and they, go, they use theory of change a lot. They bring it back to their theory of change to see what's changing and they update that. And they do a few surveys and things. And then they bring it all together in, um, well, there's always a sort of annual reflection where all the data comes together, but each piece of work has reflections at the end of each sprint, like you might have a 60 day sprint, sprint on one particular thing and collect the data and do the work and then look at how it's worked. So short cycles, of reflection and adaption and then longer cycles where more people come together. We just had one this week where all the towns come together and they're presenting their data back to each other. Yeah, so a lot of MSC actually because in this thing um, and logs because everybody can do it. You don't have to be have a PhD in evaluation to do that. You can engage. Yeah. Thanks. Did you have a question? Yeah, um... Your, your place-based approach is, is, is there in, in Australia. Um, seems not to be too contested, uh, perhaps, but I work in some areas where, where it is contested. So there's quite a lot of investment while people have still some doubts about the process of private sector standards. And they throw money to the private sector to overdraft them with goals. Really, so there is a strong accountability and a skeptic type of critical. Uh, group looking at those things, and then um, in that project which I'm, I'm assisting, it, they also do that outcome, uh, or we call it uh, outcome harvesting impact or something, or example effect, because it's the only way, only thing you can do it to show systemic change or what, yeah, the, the things which you think are significant changes, which which might have a change potential, a systemic change. But the, 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 the critics, they will say, yeah, but you only, in per definition, you only harvest uh, positive examples. And, and it doesn't help us to reflect on if it really works. Well, I'll just say, first of all, we look at the data for the population data right across all of the data. So we are looking, so like, say you might have, uh, you might be looking at child development, you know, uh, metrics. Um, you might be looking at um, employment figures. You look at all of it, good or bad, going up or going down. And when you think, and you are also listening to changes in how people are talking and what's happening. And a contribution analysis is, is, is often decided when there's both going on, but we still report on all the population. Like most of these initiatives will be reporting on the metrics that they've chosen you know, whether they're good or bad, if they're declining. In a contribution analysis, it will tell you what the stats are and it will say, you know, um, the, the development, the, um, child development is still going down. So they don't hide that data. So it's in a context, if that makes sense. So that's the first thing is all the data is looked at. It's not just the good data. It's just that we dive in a bit more deeply when we think something is going particularly well, but we have dived in more deeply when things have, have been going particularly badly. I just feel it's a bit like uh, guacamole. You press here, and something splurges up over there with this stuff, and it could be negative. So we're certainly keeping a most significant change in my book can be most significantly negative change or positive. It doesn't ask for success; it asks for change. So we do cover both. Mm -hmm. And believe me, there's community coups in this sort of work. So community rise up and tell everybody to get lost and 
and there's conflict and uh, things are not don't always go well all the time. But there's always a strong rejection of communicating through the thunders and negatives. Well, not with this stuff. This is all generally speaking. Um, this general sharing of all the data because it's a learning culture. Good data think, and the bad data. Yeah, I mean, it sounds to me like the, the sort of accountability culture in which this is, this is happening is is a bit different, mm -hmm. right? And that yeah. the critical reflection that's happening across all levels, right? It's not just the role of the evaluator to do that critical assessment of the So it becomes kind of more distributed. That's right, it's distributed. The evaluator often works depending on how distributed it is, like there's degrees of community led in the most extreme ones, which I'm going to be talking about our town, which is the most community led initiative I'm working on. We're going to be talking about that in the systems innovation uh, conference in a couple of weeks coming out of um, uh, Copenhagen with the Rockwell Foundation. That's online actually. And the funder, the implementer and the evaluators were all presenting on that. That one's much more um, distributed. That's a network approach where all the work, all the towns do their own evaluation work and their own, yeah, they do their own social innovation. So it's pretty, pretty out there, that one. Yeah. John, I think uh, Louise, um, thank you. I'm not a metal uh, specialist, though I've worked with a few of mine today. Um, I had two questions, I guess, and one was about the, the process already oriented approach you're describing and saying it can take upwards of nine and ten years before you really start seeing traction and so on. But I, I work in systems and think about systems change in more stochastic uh, ways where you see these, these sudden bursts of activity or systemic change, both positive and negative, that occur. So it's not a linear thing, but a progression. No. And the way some of that was being portrayed was an assumption, even though you were saying it wasn't a series of steps and uh, Marina was describing the iterative nature of things, the feedback loops and so on. But wondering, uh, what I didn't hear so much was where what we describe in our work in Sussex sustainability is synergy drivers, where you see these, these bursts of activity mm -hmm. where some things converge and you start to see rapid shifts in practice and, and outcomes that, that uh, can be positive. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how you capture those and how you also conceptually describe those. Maybe I'll stop with that. And allow you to well, that's what we call bubbling up. Um, that's why we've got eyes and ears everywhere to look and try and find it. So, I mean, in a way, when we started this work, there was an obsession with the population level indicators, right? Governments wanted to see change in population, employment rates, more jobs, you know, better learning outcomes at school, better rates, you know, that they were obsessed with that. And we were trying to park it, really, to say, we'll give you it, but not yet, come. it'll come. And so that was our effort to sort of show them that it's there, and then we haven't forgotten it. <laughs> and then do the work that needs to be done, which is around what you're talking about. But even that bubble ups doesn't happen until you've got people employed. Like in our town, for example, we had a two year process to select the towns and they you know, had a year of capacity building and then and then the towns were selected and then they got given money and they employed local staff to do the work. So in those two years, you're not going to get a lot of bubbling up. You're going to get capacity building. You're going to get um, uh, learning about how to start. So. So we see that bubble up as the middle phase. So we don't we do we do middle we do bubble up track, tracking the ripples and the bubbles in the middle phase, and not at the beginning because we've learned there's no point because it's not it's too early. So even that sort of work has its place. Yeah. So in the middle phase in the middle phases that's exactly what we're doing, and it, that's why it's just all in one big blob <laughs> because. <laughs> We don't really know what's going to bubble up, what's going to change, but we know there will be a lot of change and some of it will be good and some of it bad and we need to keep a track on it. But there's sort of, it always operates at two levels. There's always little initiatives and we're evaluating them as well. Like, let's have this 
campaign around this thing and see what happens. And then we're looking at the net effect of all of the initiatives together in one concentrated location. Remember, this is all happening in quite a small community. So you start to get um, the aggregation effect of all of the things happening. And we're trying to keep a track on that as well. That was going to be my second question about place-based and, and issues of scaling and, and spread of ideas and innovations. And obviously context matters above all else. And therefore that's why the approach makes sense. But the question of when there are opportunities for learning across places and whether mm -hmm. there's been any thinking done about that, about those communities at different points. And what I was going to mention again in terms of the way change happens in lumpy yeah. kind of uh, steps is that some communities that you really intervene and may come into will already be ahead. Mm. That, that some of that yeah. grounded work, that foundational work mm. is already happening. Absolutely. Whereas others aren't just getting started and the opportunity yeah. for that cross fertilization. Absolutely. They're all networks. They're all yeah. networks. We use networks approaches. All, all of the towns, all a network with other towns. And there's they convene, it's, it's low hanging fruit, it'd be crazy not to do it. Yeah. So there's all this convening between towns and we, and we do evaluate the networks as well and the influence of the network. Yeah, so it, they're all different. Like in our town, for example, there's six towns, there's a network of six towns. It's got systems change ambition. So it's got ambitions to change the policy, the government policy. So there's a network. Uh, so there's work at the town level and then there's work at the network level. And we evaluate both, but the network level is more um, currently sort of would be evaluated by us, the evaluators, whether the work at the town is being evaluated by the town evaluators. Mm. Yeah. I just want to um, give the people online a chance, if you can hear me. If there's anybody online who wants to unmute and ask a question in the last couple of minutes, please do. The floor is yours. Now's your chance. Now's your chance. I've been carrying these uh, brochures around the world and trying to get rid of them. So if anybody wants to find them, it sounds like they're. So Lily, did you have a final? Yeah, it was. It was just getting back. I'm working on a piece of the monitoring evaluation learning manager here, and I'm trying to work on pieces sort of looking at trends and dependencies. And one of the things that's emerging is this sort of the localization agenda and the sort of increasing ownership. Uh, you know, that that's oh yeah. Oh. Inherited. Yeah. But that at the same time, that the sort of the accountability, the, the sort of scrutiny on traditional funding agencies is also increasing and they're sort of learning. So, it, you know, there's a, there's a real sort of tension there. Yeah. It's only going to get better. And then hearing this is like, oh, wow, it, there is a, you know, because you think, well, what's, what's going to give? In this in this place, because they're both two forces that are, are mm -hmm. you know, they're completely at loggerheads, and they're both growing in intensity. So, so any insights from you in terms of how this learning culture was developed, how you this this system where there was sort of openness to sort of take a step back. And, well, I mean, obviously you set set up a very compelling framework, um, but. That that must there must have been a journey there as well to get the the, the state aid yeah. on board. Just, just to say we've got about a minute left, and I'm sure that's that question. It'll take much longer than a minute. So one minute. I'd have to say that um, <laughs> it's really important to know that I'm just the evaluator, right? I work in these spaces, but there's amazing groups of people who are the social innovators and the funders, and it requires a different sort of approach from everybody. And evaluate is a part of it. And I've been on this journey about how do I do this work myself? How do I show up differently? But equally, that's happened across the, and the, the funders as well have really worked on being different. In, in the most successful ones, there are high trust models. Mm -hmm. On our town there, there is no requirement for reporting from the towns. Can you believe it? It's so different than international development. The towns don't have to report because, you know, nobody's asking them to. Because this is money that they've, you know, they've won and they're using it. And they, if they, they will, they will report back to their own community. But there's no requirement to report to the funder. The funder doesn't ask for reports. The funder wants to learn what works. Mm -hmm. So we have learning reports. But that's it. So that's the future. But like that took. They are. I mean. <laughs> Holy grail future that we might. <laughs> 
it's really, um, I think it's been really interesting to hear about the work you're doing in such a different context, right? Both in terms of how males understood accountability, but also seeing a lot of similarities, mm. I would say, with the conversations that we're having around being complexly aware. And, you know, and, and I love that it's combined with that kind of depth of participation of people actually at different levels being part of that critical reflection on what's changing. So thank you so much My pleasure. for being here with us and, and taking the time to share your ideas. And I think everybody knows how to stay in touch and I'm sure we'll- Oh yeah, this, we have this community. If you're an evaluator, this is a community of nerdy evaluators. So only for the faint, not for the faint hearted. Mm -hmm. It's free to join the Clear Horizon Academy. And there's loads of resources and the learners who do our courses, they stay on there. And we have people who answer questions, which is always useful. <laughs> Great. So let's say thank you very much. Thank you for joining us.